In a previous video, I notified you guys of my miniature enclosure series. So if you would like to take a peek at the plans and see a demo, stick around. We got that and more coming right up. What is going on guys? It's the Budget Base Head. Welcome back to the channel. For anybody who has been here for a while, you guys know that I love band pass enclosures. Right now, what you see on the table are three different enclosures. Two of them are band pass. First up, you got the vented enclosure. This is a classical ported design that many manufacturers do put out. This one right here is fitted. All of these are fitted for a four inch driver. Second up is going to be a fourth order band pass. It does have a one to three ratio. Fourth order classically is one sealed section, one ported section. As you guys can see there. You got chamber one being a 0.3 cubic foot. Chamber two being 0.8. And the port tuning is 100 hertz. Port displacement is 0.014 cubic foot. Very small enclosures. Next up is the sixth order bandpass enclosures. Its chamber is also one to three volume uh, ratio. Chamber one is 0.3 cubic foot. Chamber two is 0.08 cubic foot. That chamber is tuned to 70 hertz. That's the smaller chamber. And the larger chamber is actually tuned to 35 hertz. In this video, I'll be going behind the scenes and letting you guys know how I got all this conducted. Later on, I will actually share with you why I started this here. But for right now, let's go take a look behind the scenes and see first what it is you guys will be dealing with. Once again, with any great build, you're gonna need some floor plans and you're also gonna need some tools to work with. So that's kind of what you guys are looking at right now. These are the flat packs for all of the builds. This is the one for the fourth order and the sixth order. And as you guys can see, it's actually an additional one on the table. That's because I actually have one for a folded horn as well. First thing first, the biggest tool of the lot is this drill press right here. Harbor Freight Special. Picked this guy up about a year and a half ago. And it's really, really good for drilling straight holes and when you have need for that. This is an old Black & Decker jigsaw. I actually was This was actually given to me by one of my neighbors a long time ago. It really has served me well. <laughs> Drill bits, very, very important when you're doing woodwork. Get you a fresh pair of drill bits. I've had these guys here going on a year and a half or so. Picked them up at the big box store. I believe it was Home Depot. Paid less than 20 bucks for them. They've done me well. Next up is gonna be a some type of drill, hand drill. Doesn't have to be a cordless one like this uh, Matrix from Black & Decker. But just get yourself a drill very handy and a sander you don't have to have an electric sander like i do but this is an orbital one orbiting orbiting one from walmart brand hyper tough very cheap very efficient it gets the job done it's way way better than doing things by hand and of course if you're working with glue uh wood get yourself some wood glue it'll make everything all worth the while. A lot of people think that it's the screws that hold things together with wood. It's usually the clamping force and glue. The glue really is the star of the show. And that'll do it for the tool list. Up next, what you guys are seeing is a second. Okay, here we go with the drill press. Right now, what you guys are looking at is just me getting ready to do a, a guide hole. This is really the most uh, effective way to get a hole started anytime you have to do a center hole. 
like what I'm going to be doing right now. I mean, if anytime you have to cut a hole in the center of a piece of wood like this, get your hole big enough for your jigsaw to go in and it make life a whole lot easier. And that's what I'm going to do to all these guys. Next up is working with the jigsaw. Once again, just keep it simple. Try to not make this too big. Always try too small in the beginning. And, and right now, if you have a circle jig, this will be a lot easier. I have a circle jig. It just was a lot quicker to work with this. With circle jigs, you have to make many, many passes going deeper and deeper until you punch out of the wood. And with four different enclosures to do, I didn't feel like doing all that. So I just went ahead, got the jig. It's a lot easier, especially with half inch wood. This is half inch MDF if anyone is uh, curious about that. And this will be the speaker that I'm going to be putting inside of this enclosure. A little bit more on this guy a little bit later. And what you want to see is no light going through those holes. And there we go. I achieved that. Plus it's going to have a gasket as well, but airtight fit nonetheless. And once again, just give me another look at the baffles. These are the flat packs at the end of what you're doing. This is going to be the fourth order. Um, I think that's the base reflex or the simple ported, ported design. This is the folded horn I was talking about. <clears throat> this is what the base reflex. So the other one was actually the fourth order band pass. The base reflex had a smallest flat pack. <clears throat> And that's to be expected. And this is the sixth order, which has the largest flat pack because it's more material. And that's that on that. Right now, what you guys are looking at is the uh, sixth order band pass. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the uh, the sixth order band pass plans. I always start out in this virtual environment first before I cut any wood. Always do your measurements in here. This is Google SketchUp. I'm sorry, it used to be called Google SketchUp. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's uh, owned by a company named Trimble. I don't know if Google owns that or Trimble bought them out, but most people still call it Google SketchUp. Or maybe Google still owns it, I don't know. But this is an aerial view of the sixth order. And as you guys can see here, in the uh, virtual environment, I have a dual baffle, but at the end, I thought that was overkill for a four inch driver, so I did not incorporate a dual baffle within the actual build. But uh, yeah, so this is all my port tuning. This is 70 hertz and 35 hertz, and this is what the floor, floor plan looks like. I forget what size wood. I think that's uh, a four foot by two foot sheet of um, plywood in case you guys are wondering about that. Next up is the sixth order. This is what it looked like dry fitted. I always dry fit everything together before you do any nailing or gluing. I always dry fit to make sure your, your pieces fit together and everything that was in the virtual world has translated over to the real world. And in my case, there was a few <laughs> a few glitches that I, that I made some mistakes on a table saw. But other than that, everything came out looking pretty, pretty, pretty good. I was satisfied with it. So basically what I'm going to be doing here is taking my measurements, making sure everything fit well, and then just doing a reversal on the um, flat pack. Next up is going to be the base reflex box. Most people just call this a simple ported or vented uh, enclosure and this is where all of this started in case you guys are wondering why is this guy making these little bitty boxes this is the seal chamber right here I was curious uh, about this set of bookshelf speakers that I have that they, they sound excellent uh, one from Dayton audio and I wondered if I can better that build and that's when I started messing around with different designs right here you see an aerial view of uh, my cubic footage as far as port di displacement and things of that nature. I do everything here in the software first. Figure out what that stuff is, tune everything else later as well. Uh, but it all starts here. Before you cut any wood, get you a program such as this. It'll save you a lot of time and effort. And that's what everything is supposed to look like. 
once it's uh, fully assembled. But anyway, the uh, Day 90 um, MK402s is a, a, a good sounding uh, set of bookshelf speakers, but I wanted to make it better. So I went off in here and said, if I give it a bigger chamber, tune it lower, give it more port area, would it sound better? And from there, my imagination just went crazy. So that's why you got these videos. And right now, what you're looking at is the flat pack for the uh, fourth order bass reflex. <clears throat> I'm just going to be getting everything set up, making certain that all my parts fit together. Like I said, once again, dry fitted. You want to make sure everything fits together dry before you mess around with putting it together because that's the worst thing to do is to spend all that time putting this thing together just to have it uh, some something either is in the wrong place or the wrong dimension. Especially when, you, when you're when you going to see once we get off into the fourth and sixth orders, a lot of these, these internal ports and things of that nature are the same length and you can get them jacked up as far as uh, misplacing them. Uh, right now is the uh, fourth order. You got your seal section on the left and you got your ported section on the right. And as you can see, I did leave the um, the measurement for my port displacement there, which is 0 0.014 cubic foot. Again, very, very small. But just keep in mind, guys, anything you do on this scale, you can actually scale up. This is a four inch driver. So in theory, you can, you can times this or multiply this by three and you got a 12 inch driver. You see? So that's kind of like one way of looking at it. Of course, some things would change because the TS parameters would change, but in short, in a nut cell, shell, just to keep it simple, this is just a smaller version of what you would actually build for a larger driver. And here are more um, dimensions for this piece. Once again, this is the fourth order band pass enclosure. Port tuning is, a, is I think it's, I actually tuned this thing later on I want to say at 100, 100 hertz is what I tuned it to. And this is the cut sheet. Once again, I believe that's a two by four piece of wood. And once again, this is the flat pack for the fourth order. Just getting things set up, making sure everything fit before I actually mess around with putting any glue to any of this stuff. That's very, very important. As you guys can see, I'm having some issues right there with um, with putting stuff together because one of my walls were in the wrong place. And this is what it looks like. I must say I had fun building these guys. I had a whole lot of fun. I hope you guys are enjoying this as much as I am. <clears throat> A lot of time was spent on this. I mean, you're talking about over 250 hours of video footage that I cut through just to give you guys this video. So if some of you are looking like, oh, this thing is very, very long, just know that um, it's not as long as it could have been. <laughs> but anyway, right now what you guys are seeing is me just making certain that my baffles um, are, are, are correctly um, Aligned with the speaker in the way that I want to put this driver. I'm going to be using the drill press To get this done the correct way the correct way and These are all my bits that I'm using Using a drill press so some people probably are like well, I can't afford a drill press I don't have a drill press. Why are you even using a drill press? Why not use a hand tool? Well, the reason why you want to use a drill press is because the, the drill press is it gives you the straightest possible uh, hole. So anytime you're mounting something like this, you want that hole not to be like slanted because then that would ruin your your whole setup. So if you want the straightest hole possible, especially when building furniture and things of that nature, use a drill press whenever you can. Use a drill press. And right now what you guys are seeing is a glue job, is the beginning of the glue job on the uh, vented enclosure or the the uh the base reflex one 
and as you guys can see the inner port there is already glued I, I find this very very uh, helpful when you're doing builds like this is to take those inner ports and just go ahead and glue them together because if you glue them together it'll make life a whole lot more easier I've seen people struggle with sliding port walls internally once they've gotten <clears throat> the X what they would do they would externally glue things together and then slide the ports in and a lot of times they, they catch hell doing that because the, um, the wood don't want to slide in correctly and sometimes you can either have um, the port slanted so the bottom of the port would be wider than the top or vice versa so in order to get away with that or to not run into that problem in the beginning kind of do what I'm going to show you right here right now I'm going to take an already pre-assembled port and I'm going to attach it to the uh, to the baffle and the way I do that if you guys can see I'm going to use a speed square you see that I'm st uh, this this speed square what, what that's going to do is make certain that that, uh, that that is at a 90 degree angle so that when I place it back onto the um, when I fit it back to the enclosure I don't have to worry about my walls and my ports being uh, not you know not being correct and at the end this is kind of what it looks like in the rough I went ahead I slapped the uh, drivers in there just to see what it looks like what they what they fit like after the glue had dried and I must say you know they are already looking impressive to me the, the one I'm most curious about actually is the base reflex one because in my mind I'm like I think I may have made the chamber a little bit too big and the bigger you go with the chamber the, the uh, you, you start to lose punch I didn't um, really like care care all that much about it I know it wasn't gonna sound perfect uh, but I, the music that I listen to and the you know the videos that I listen to that I'm gonna plan on be less listen to this thing too it doesn't cause for a lot of punchy bass you know so I'm not worried about it that is the fourth order bass reflex this is the uh, sixth order band pass right here and I'm just checking my measurements once again just to make certain that everything is right where it's supposed to be that's 16 inches like it's supposed to be like if you didn't make those walls as straight and use that if I didn't use that speed square like I did the top of this can be instead of it can be a quarter up to a quarter inch or more off because you've allowed the wood to stray at some point you didn't keep it uh, perfectly straight but in this case it wasn't the case and everything's looking good just another look at the uh, the ports I did round everything over I didn't show you the guys that I didn't want to make this video too long but as you guys can see the ports are rounded internally and externally anywhere where air would travel I did try and round it over for that purpose and that's kind of like what I'm showing you guys right here I know some people are gonna say well where's the bracing I mean, with a four inch driver, it's not gonna flex half inch MDF. I, I just don't see that happening. So I didn't even, I didn't put any additional bracing in there. I could have done it just for display purposes or whatever, but I thought what was more important is the airflow. So I focused on that more. And that'll do it for that. All right, so what we're looking at right now, is the tops so we have to fashion the tops to the enclosure now these are test enclosures believe it or not for the time being so what I went ahead and did is I went ahead and made this where this thing is gonna be removable the top I'm gonna be able to access this and to be able to service this whenever need be and that's what you guys are seeing right now the process of me uh, doing that right now you what you're looking at is the terminal cup that goes on the back it actually has a, a crossover on the back of it as well these are these are parts from the MK402 bookshelf speaker it's disassembled and I'm just using its parts okay in order to do this what you see right here are the wood inserts that I'm going to be using I think these are M4 
uh, wood inserts. Uh, yes, that's what that is. These are M4s. And I also have the screws sitting over there. So that's the hardware that I'm going to be needing in order to complete this is what I'm going to do. So I want, like I said, I want to make it detachable and it has to be airtight as well. And I'm going to show you guys later on how I get it airtight. And of course, you can't get this job done without drill bits. You got to have your drill bits. The other one was by DeWalt and these are by, um, I actually forgot just that quick. <laughs> I got like three set of drill bits and some tape <laughs> so what we're gonna be doing now is getting this thing taped up that's very important because once you get the drilling on this thing you do not want it to wander or stray you don't want it to so you want to go ahead and um, and get that out of the way get it get it locked down as secure as possible and right now I'm gonna get this uh, this this plate right here on my drill press I don't need that plate so I'm gonna go ahead and get that guy out of the way and this is what I'm going to be sitting the box on top of right here. And that's how I'm going to be drilling. The one thing I want you guys to notice about it, this, this, uh, I don't have enough to play with here. So what I'm going to do is just add some extra material there and that'll help me out. Right now I'm just going to get my pilot hose drilled. I think this is a one eighth uh, drill bit that I'm using right here. I'm just gonna be stepping through, getting it. And I didn't drill every hole. I kind of went overkill on my plan. And I was like, "Come on, you don't need all them holes." So I didn't. I didn't drill them. I just got the corners and the, the middle sections. That's for both the ports and the walls. And that's about it. This is me chucking the little guy out, and I'm gonna have to put the big guy in. It's all about selection. Uh, right now, what I'm trying to do is just size the correct drill bit for the wood insert. You want one that's slightly smaller than the drill bit, I mean, than the wood insert. And this is what I came up with. This is this guy right here. And as you guys see, once I place it over top, only thing you see sticking out is the threads, and that's what you want. You only want the threads sticking out. You want the body of it to actually go inside. <laughs> and just showing you guys, that's, I think it's a 13 something. Couldn't get it on camera. And there it is, 13 by 64. And the three by 16, are the two I'm using. I wanted one slightly larger as well in order to um, just give me that added security and just in case the one I choose is too small, just go a step up. And do it like that so get that guy inserted chuck it down and we're ready to, we're ready to drill right here just as the as we did with the pilot hose we're just gonna be going around uh, making sure things fit before we continue and there we go all right so Right now, what you guys are looking at is the countersinks. You're gonna have to get this here countersunk because the, the uh, I'm sorry. Let me give you guys the reveal of what it looks like once I actually finish with it. So those transfer perfectly. The schematics on top is very crucial to uh, a project like this. Always get your schematics drawn on top. Right now, I'm, trying, I'm testing the um, the uh, wood insert and it looks like it fits pretty good and now I want to test is the length of the screws right here and the reason why this is important is because I'm gonna airtight I'm gonna I want to airtight seal so I'm gonna be building a gasket and this doesn't seem like it's sticking out long enough the gasket itself is a quarter inch tall so that thing only looks like it was sticking out about a quarter inch so I'm gonna have to get some countersinks and we're gonna have to countersink that. So once I choose the right one for that, 
I'm gonna use the hand drill for this. So some of you probably are wondering why I use a hand drill now you use a drill press before. Well, the drill press have already uh, gotten it straight for me. You want just that straight hole to transfer all the way through. But once you do that, you can just use a drill bit and be done. I mean, use a hand tool and be done with it. Just cleaning things up for right now. And now I'm gonna go over here and see some damage that I did kind of widening those holes on those corners kind of damaged something a bit, but it's okay because I'm gonna round them. I plan on rounding them over in the future anyway, so that shouldn't be a big deal. Not a major deal. In case you guys are wondering what drill bit, what size uh, bits to use for that, there you go. And as you guys can see, now I have a lot more length than I did at first. And that was the goal. So right now we're going to try to get this thing drilled in. You guys are going to see a, tr a problem that I ran into. This is something that, that happens when you're, when you're using uh, these wood inserts, especially with, with wood such as MDF. Okay, once I got that in there, as you guys can see, I'm gonna have to hit that corner. And I don't know if you can see, it's a micro, micro, a microscopic, it's like a hairline fracture once I put it into the wood because the wood is so soft. MDF is so soft. Let me bag this up so you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about. So once I go inside, you see what's happening there? splitting the wood so my remedy to that was to first get the uh, wood dust I thought maybe the wood dust was still inside and it wouldn't let it go down so I said I'm gonna but as you guys can see that wasn't the case that corner is just too weak to do this so what I'm gonna be doing is using the old trick I, that I learned from the old schools put some pressure on it then you can go in it just fine, no cracks. See that? Let see it, let you guys see that again. You clamp it down, and what this does is it prevents it, it, it literally forces the wood to uh, squeeze that um, that drill bit, and the, fight, the, uh, the threads of it doesn't force the wood outward. It actually forces the pressure forces the uh, the threads of the drill bit into the wood more, so you don't get that splitting. And this is a bigger bit that I planned on using. I said, well, I may as well just go around with a larger bit in order to get this, you know, to not have that problem again. So you clean things up, you come back and you try it again. But I, as you guys can see, I was having the same problem anyway. So pretty much what I had to do on every hole, which is a pain in the rear, but at the end is is worth it. I'm used to dealing more so with three quarters MDF than I am with um, half inch MDF with wood search anyway. These things work best in hardwood, not something like this. MDF for y'all who don't know is only wood dust and glue. <laughs> That's all it is. It's basically wood dust and glue and of course I had to do my corners the same way I can remember shopping around not long ago with a corner a corner jig just for clamping corners and I didn't buy it now I wish I had but anyway it worked out for the best I didn't get any splitting and this is what it looks like that's those first couple victims I added some glue in there as well. I don't know if you guys can see. I missed that corner. But it's okay. I'll come back and get it later. But the, the grip pliers work. So in case you guys are having that issue on one of your builds, that's a way to remedy it. Next up is going to be um, cutting out for the tweeter. And in order to do that, what I'm using here is the Forstner bits. 
Fortune of Bix come in, in really, really in handy when, especially if you're trying to counter sync some things. These things are amazing. And as you guys can see, I'm using the one half for the tweeter cutout. But before you do that, you need to uh, get your placement correct. So I'm going to just be using an old school method of doing this. Just by placing everything, get a spare piece of straight edge wood and use it as a straight edge. And just move forward with that. Cut it out. Get everything cross plane. Find your center. And it's time to use the bit. Once again, the drill press is on the table. And like I said, and if you don't have a drill press, you can you can do this with a hand tool because Fortune of Bix have a, a guide right there in the center. You guys just see me punch that out. You can use a hand tool with this. It's not it's, this is not completely necessary, but um, to get that straightness going, I just wanted to use it because it's always best if you got a drill press, use it. And this is where I'm going to continue with the hand tool until I punch through and this is what it looks like okay now it's gonna be time for the terminal cut terminal cut was a bit tricky because I didn't measure things like I was supposed to have but it's okay we got everything going I use another old school method just to see how much distance was in between the actual terminal cup opening and the um, where it actually the crossover section is so once I got all that going once again get the drill bits make a guide hole in this case four because we are going to be doing a corner you can use fortune bits to do this as well get those guide holes going actually it'd be a lot quicker if you do that and this is the test fit and it works that's a success so right now what we're going to be doing is getting this thing sealed up, working on getting it airtight. And like I said, it's a quarter inch high, it's a half inch wide, which is perfect for, for this setup right here. This is what it looks like. And this thing just have a uh, one sticky side, one side not sticky. <clears throat> this is window seal. So it works best for what we're trying to do now, which is to keep air where it's supposed to go like keep it routed properly so just get it stuck down on there and yes it's covering those holes but that's okay I later found out that the screws punch through it quite easily and this is what it looks like and like I said this is a test rig so you want to make sure that it is uh, accessible anytime you need for it to be And next up, what we're going to be doing is checking out the sound test. And for this, I'm going to be letting you guys actually see this is the default pair of the MK402s. Yeah, so I kind of just wanted to let you guys see that these, this is a pretty decent pair of uh, bookshelf speakers. They are not something that you know, to be laughed at or something that actually needed improvement. This is just me and what I wanted to do. Right now is a real world test, real world music test of it.
Yeah, just kind of wanted to give you guys um, a fair uh, shot at this to let you guys see that, you know, this is not, that, that these things are pretty decent. They're not crappy ones. And I want you guys to see originally what they sound like before I get to doing my tests or whatnot. What I've done now is actually uh, set it up with the uh, Pioneer DEH-150. And I'm going to be doing a left and right comparison. Um, let me let me pause right quick. What you guys seen earlier in the earlier setup? This setup right here is actually being ran on the default setup here. This is a powered pair. The speaker on the on the on the right actually has the power input and slaves to the one on the uh, on the left. But what I'm going to be doing for the test itself is I'm actually going to be running it from the car stereo. So I'm checking my voltage here, which we're good. We're above 12. And I'm going to be running it from here, and I'm going to be doing a left and right. On the left is the the, um, the base reflex enclosure you guys just seen me do. And on the right is going to be that passive speaker, that non-powered one, is what you're going to be seeing on the right. Okay? So this is this is not under its own power. This is going to be a bass sweep from 150 all the way down to 20 hertz for the guy on the left. And that's 20 hertz. And that's 20 hertz. So, yeah. These things are tuned to uh, 50 hertz, I believe. I, I tuned the, um, the, Vinit, the Vinit guy to. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what you got there. Next up is going to be real world music. <clears throat> I'm going to let you see what they sound like together. Then I'm going to give them to you separate.
This is going to be the second track of real world music with these guys. Hope you guys are enjoying. Just checking my voltage, still above 12. Good. All right, so that'll do it for this one, guys. What do you guys think about that? Let me know in the comment section below. Um, do you guys think that I should do the fourth order and sixth order band pass the same way that I did this? Meaning that should I put the crossover network inside, place the tweeter on the front, and use it as a bookshelf setup? Or should I dedicate the fourth order and sixth order bandpass setup to only subwoofer functionality that's the question that i have for you guys because i'm kind of split in between those two options i want to actually keep the bass reflex for uh, a better design a better bass response to me in my opinion they sound better i don't know i'll let you guys be the judge of that but i want to know should i keep these two guys or just go ahead and test it as is and convert it later on if need be what do you guys think make it a subwoofer enclosure or put the tweeter and crossover on the inside let me know what you guys think in the comment sections below until next time if you like diy bills comparisons and competitions please consider clicking that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing